What's up, everybody? It's your host, Andrew Carpenter, and welcome to another episode of FinTech. What the heck? The podcast for financial professionals, everything FinTech, and the future of data. Today, I'll be interviewing the Chief Operating Officer of Everest Technologies, Nick Beatty, along with Intrinio's VP of Product Development, Alec Isaac. And I'll also talk about standardizing financial data and its benefits. My guest today is Nick Beatty. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Every Risk Technologies. He is a Chartered Financial Analyst who has been working in investment management technology for the last 10 years. At EverRisk, Nick heads up the global operations, business development, and works closely with EverRisk's institutional clients to implement customized automated technology solutions. Welcome to the show, Nick. Andrew, thanks for having me. Why don't you get started just by uh, explaining um, what EverRisk does like for people who might not understand front offices and the kind of challenges that they face? Sure. So we work with um, a lot of institutional investors across banks, uh, wealth management, asset managers, um, hedge funds, family offices, um, primarily taking in all of their investment data, whether it be trades, uh, portfolios um, on a daily or intraday basis. Um, we're producing different analytics for them associated with performance, uh, with risk, with compliance, um, and, and, and a number of different ways. Um, but beyond performance analytics, the whole platform has is wrapped in a, a large automation layer. Um, so taking it one step further than just producing data or analytics, but being able to actively use that. Um, so um, these workflows are acting as almost like digital analysts where they can scan through data, find things that are too high, too low, um, send emails, uh, create Excel sheets, um, um, log and tag data and kind of raise their hand if they see something that's off. Um, so the idea is to kind of take away a lot of the operational burdens of the day-to-day -day for these investors and uh, automate a lot of those processes with technology. Are, are those uh, portfolio managers, the folks that have to keep up with compliance and, and allocating um, portfolios and making investment decisions, um, you probably have some firsthand knowledge of what their day-to-day -day is like. Are they usually overworked? I mean, is there just a lot of things for them to keep track of? Is that kind of the idea that you could take some of that burden away so that they can focus more on research and relationships and things like that? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a very data centric <laughs> industry, right? For everyone involved. Um, I mean, I think uh, the old school way of doing this is right. Um, you're getting a PDF report, right? Whether it be weekly or daily, it's um, a few different analysts that take a couple hours to maybe produce this. Um, and then you've got pages and pages of pie charts, graphs, tables to kind of scan through um, and make sure you know everything looks intact. If anything, it's like I said, too high or too low or, or out of whack. But I think that um, being able to have um, technology scan through that, it knows um, what normal values are, um, what the ranges are, um, whether that's for compliance, for portfolio management or, or rebalancing, um, you know, you can do that as the market opened. Um, so, you know, you could spend more of your time uh, trading, um, idea generation, research, and, and leave a lot of that kind of repetitive tasks um, that can be uh, um, coded in uh, to this technology um, in the hands of them to be automated. Does it make them better analysts, better traders, and then maybe even get better results at the end of the day because of that for their clients? Yeah, I think that every single fund investor, everyone we're working with sits on an enormous amount of data, right? And it's it's valuable, whether that's market data, it's trades, it's um, how, you know, in a similar market environment, how did they navigate this situation previously, right? Um, if you can make use of that data and, and surface it in an intelligent and active manner, um, you don't have to start from scratch every time, right? There's a lot of um, benchmarking of how you handled something before that you can, you can go off of. Um, and I think it, it's, helps for a lot of investment uh, decision support uh, research. And, and um, so you're not just starting at step one every time you're starting at you know, step five or six. Yeah, I would imagine I would want my investment professional using something like this because I know they're going to be less overwhelmed and they're more focused on getting me great returns. So I, I think that makes a lot Absolutely. of sense. 
I said in, in your introduction, uh, I'll, I'm going to read it again, but you work closely with EverRisk's institutional clients to implement, implement customized automated technology solution. Can you solutions? Can you talk a little bit about the, the customization? Like, um, why do you have to customize it? What kind of things can you customize? What does that process look like for uh, one of your users? Sure. I think we try to take a, a different approach than uh, most technology providers in the industry, right? This isn't this isn't just a the same platform that every single client is getting, and um, you know, a, a, a kind of a copy and paste interface. I think that every single fund, every single investor has a different process that's specific to their strategy, specific that's specific to their clients' needs. Um, so therefore, their their workflows are different. They have um, different views of how they want to see different numbers, different reports. Uh, so it's important for it to be customizable. Um, if if uh, the firms or funds don't have the resources of, of large development teams to build something that's customizable for them as an, as an internal system. Um, what we'll do is we take a, a low code, no code approach in our platform. Uh, so users can drag and drop different digital workers or widgets and reports um, so that everything is a bit customizable to them. Um, you know, we work kind of in a consultative matter with them as kind of as experts in that uh, workflow space to help them design these repeatable workflows or if they have ad hoc reports they want to run or um, where they want to send and distribute uh, numbers or data, um, you know, we can help them uh, to accomplish that and enable them to uh, get everything set up. I like that. It kind of fits with the, the overall model of making the front office job easier. But I, every time I've ever used software, I'm like, well, we're a little bit different than another firm and part that difference is good. That's our competitive advantage sometimes, like why we operate differently or maybe our, you know, an analyst investment strategy might be specific. So they have specific needs. So I, I like that approach and I bet it, um, I bet it makes adoption a little bit easier if instead of forcing them to change, you can have a little bit of change on your um, platform to fit with their special way of doing business. Yeah, I think it makes it um, it makes it a lot easier to say yes. We could solve that problem, right? I think uh, right. there's a, a lot of different solutions. You can say yes, uh, yes. Take our API and and code everything up on your end towards how you want to do that. But if we can kind of provide a, a, a no code, low code way to have everything everything customized, it makes it easier uh, to fit to their process, right? They can uh, continue about going and, and doing it the way that, that they've been successful at, and um, it doesn't have the the large kind of overhang of having to develop and create something internally from scratch. Yeah, and it's it sounds nice. Like if I if I ran a front office, I would want a, that consultative approach where the answer isn't just do it yourself because that's what I've been doing. If I'm working in that front office, it's just figuring it out and grinding through like all these different systems um, that don't talk to each other, that don't automate any part of my job. And I'm always I have I kind of like have empathy for someone like who really wants to be an analyst to work, have a relationship with a client and to spend a lot of time doing research and making trades. And then the distractions start to come in and um, like eliminating as much of that as possible probably makes the financial analyst happier. I mean, they, they get to focus more on what they love doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think so much of the industry is, is um, a lot of Excel spreadsheets, right? That one analyst mm -hmm. might have saved locally on their desk. And if they're, sick or out or um, even, you know, leave the firm, Who, how is this doing, you know, being done before, but having everything kind of cloud-based um, connected and, and um, you know, we'll try to be the glue between a number of different systems. So, so nothing's really uh, siloed in one, in one um, uh, aspect or another. Um, and so that try to help and kind of, uh, you know, be open and flexible from that standpoint to link everything uh, between teams. You get a lot systems. of, a lot of, feedback from the your clients for new features and ways to improve the platform and what kind of stuff are you adding um, as time goes on yeah that's a great question i mean uh, our roadmap is a hundred percent from client demand or uh, cool. client conversations i think you know what we really want to avoid is just developing a platform in a vacuum and then going to the market and saying this will be great Nobody everyone will it. love it right and i think that's a pretty good <laughs> recipe for for failure but um right uh, uh, with kind of being able to design workflows, it makes it easier to uh, deliver functionality. Um, you know, we've we've had some um, really interesting ideas from clients as far as what their workflows 
um, would be and what they need, you know, whether it's um, just generating a simple report to doing uh, pre-trade compliance or uh, filing a report with a regulator, um, generating kind of client proposals, or even, um, you know, if they've got a thousand different clients scanning through to see what their allocations are, is there new research that applies and uh, which clients might this be applicable for? So, um, you know, everything's 100% client driven. I think it's a, a great way to kind of lead the roadmap for sure. Yeah, it makes the business more sticky because you're making happier clients. They like the platform more. They want to stay. And when new clients come on, they like it even more. And, and that allows you to grow the business and be more and more useful over time without wasting sprints on the dev side, which is an expensive way to to grow a business if you're just guessing what people want. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, I mean, they're, they're doing it every day. So they know that they know the problems that are, um, yeah. you know, specific to them and 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 if it's um everything is uh um you know it's an industry-wide problems right if they're dealing with it then, it then it makes sense to kind of develop a solution for it right yeah can you dive in and talk about this data you've mentioned this a few times like these analysts are awash in data there's reports and there are filings and market data and and all that how do you wrangle all of that for them like what what um what strategies are you using you know checks and automation and algorithms anything to help them like how do you guys dig into that yeah i think that um being able to handle and process a lot of data is is uh is, is really important um we're taking in data from a, a number of different sources for our clients um first and foremost being their specific portfolio data um, their trades so that might come from a prime broker or an administrator or a custodian uh, we've got a number of different partnerships um, uh, with with um, these guys globally. Um, so mm. um, direct pipeline set up from that. Uh, it's all in different formats, but we have to have um, parsers and mappings, you know, that the workflows are actually very skilled at. Um, secondly, we're taking in a number of different sources of, of market data, right, from every type of uh, security or region, exchange. Um, uh, we're taking in... Um, different data for signals, whether it be kind of ESG data or um, another form of market data that's specific to the client. Um, many clients have individual um, other systems, right? Whether it's an OMS, an EMS, um, a specific data provider, right? We can uh, call a lot of that through APIs and link everything in. Uh, so the idea is to kind of create a golden copy of all the data they would need. Um, you know, it's important, I think, to have a lot of checks around that because, um, you know, in Excel, it's easy to kind of fat finger something and, and oh, hit yeah. a three instead of a two. And so um, knowing, you know, what percentage of things mapped appropriately, um, what criteria is OK um, or range is OK, uh, what didn't map potentially why, um, you know, if some piece of market data has been flat for three days. Let's highlight that, you know, is there something we need to get in touch with the market data provider for? Um, but it's hundreds of thousands of different kind of data points coming in daily and it's impossible for, you know, um, to have the right amount of people to kind of scan that manually and, and find those things. But in a matter of um, a few seconds, right, you can have workflows scanning this to see if something's too high, too low, out of range, needs to be addressed or escalated and then kind of automated alerts and reports then as far as uh, what needs to be addressed there. Yeah, I imagine before using a platform like yours, or if you don't have a solution like that, you would just be drowning in data. And and I would imagine that's so stressful to not like have the confidence that you can trust the data you're making your investment decisions on for your clients. Like, what a stressful existence right. <laughs> trying to keep <laughs> <laughs> well, it all starts with that as a base, right? And if uh, you need to know that everything, uh, the analytics, the reports, that the data it's all based on is sound uh, because um, you need to make the right investment decision. If it's not sound, um, you know, it's hard to, to make that decision. Uh, so mm. being able to rely on everything that, the, you know, there's there's concrete checks in place and that everything is appropriately logged and mapped is, I think, a really important piece of the process. Yeah, it, ma it makes a lot of sense. I imagine... 10, 20 years ago that this kind of automation and quality checks were more difficult because the data was harder to format. It was, wasn't really coming in in such, uh, in, in, in types of systems that you could build a platform with. Do you think that that's why you were able to do what you do is that kind of the data, the data landscape is changing a little bit? 
Yeah, I think that the data landscape as well as the technology landscape, right? Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, you know, 10, 20 years ago, a lot of systems were either locally deployed or, you know, running on um, uh, specific kind of servers related. I think that the rise kind of, of um, uh, cloud services, cloud computing across providers, you know, enabled a lot of uh, different companies, uh, data companies, technology kind of companies to be um, launched and strengthened, um, you know, without the costs of having to, you know, um, develop these large internal servers. And uh, because of this, I think it led to a lot of open and flexible companies, right, through um, APIs and um, um, uh, even kind of streaming things back and forth. Uh, so that certainly helped us a lot out, right? And so as soon as everyone's a bit more open, everyone needs to speak a bit of the same language. So I think that there's, you know, on the data side, have been a lot of standardization of different uh, ways to take in portfolio data as well. That's, that's certainly led to this. Yeah, I hate to use this word because I think it's overused, but de the data has been democratized a little bit. And um, that has made some really big gains for the the investors at the very end of the system who have their retirement portfolio or some sort of investment that's very important to them and they're small fish in the grand scheme of things. But because either they can make investments themselves or they can have their, their financial advisor um, have better tools, they've got the ability to actually have a better return. And I think that's what the industry has. People at the, have been stressed about that for a long time is that the individual investors, mom and pops, main street folks aren't able to compete with, um, with the, the, you know, the huge hedge funds and, and, and the folks that have a ton of money at the other end of the spectrum who, who had historically been the only ones who could afford these types of solutions. But now that you're bringing yeah. it to front offices around the country, I think the benefit will 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 come down to to the main street level. You're right. Uh, democratized is 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 a, is a you know a widely used word, but it's a good word for it, right? It's it's uh, everything is much more available. Um, you know, to to launch a fund, to invest, to have um, you know the right amount of data where you would have had to have you know not only kind of um, a large contract with one or two of the you know firms ten years ago that provided it, but also like you said, a, a big team checking it, and and um, so it's I think it's advanced kind of significantly um, as far as the data, and then and the providers of how they're how they're distributing it for sure. I've been I've been on your website. It's e v e r y s k dot com. Ever risk? Yep. How'd you come up with that the name? Uh, I mean, I think it's a bit of. Um, from our uh, uh, founder here, Alan Brick, who's um, you know a bit of covering every single risk we've 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 uh, um, you it. know from operationally to market. I think that um, the he was a uh, chief risk officer at a, a large hedge fund okay. uh, for a number of years. Um, so Everisk initially kind of started out as a uh, risk analytics platform. Um, you know, it's it's um, a large use case of us for a lot of our clients, um, where we've got a um, powerful kind of granular risk engine underneath everything. Um, but I think it's expanded, you know, a bit more where there's operational risks, um, you know, as far as data management, compliance checks, reporting. Uh, so it's been, yeah, a bit of a play on words there, covering kind of every risk you did, you did in, uh, encounter there in the investment management space. I like it. It's almost like a mission and I totally relate to it because I'm a super worrier. I'm constantly <laughs> worrying about every risk that could affect my business or my personal life. But it's like, um, that gets back to that nice feeling. The idea, the, the mission behind what you do is, is to reduce that stress load, reduce the worry about every risk that an analyst could have. Um, how, uh, how can people get started if they want to check you out? Is it, is come to the website and, and sign up and check it out? What's the best way to, uh, to check out your platform? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, through, through our website, um, is the easiest way. Be happy to kind of, um, show a quick demo or some, some use cases of how we're, we're helping similar clients. Um, very easy to, to kind of, uh, show or quick and have a, you know, we'd love to have a quick conversation and, and uh, discuss a bit more about how we could be of help. Yeah. And I've got, I'm going to wrap it up with a personal question because I'm a chief operating officer. I know you're a COO as well. And I came up through Intrinio's rank. So I've never been a COO at another company. And sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. And so I'm curious, what is, uh, what is the life of a COO like for you? What do you, what is, uh, what are your priorities? How do you do your job? Uh, probably very similar to how you're approaching it there. I think, um, when I'm asked that same question, it's kind of just, um, 
doing what whatever kind of is needed to be done here. You know, I think it's yeah. a, a mix of kind of the long term strategic mixed with uh, the day to day of making sure everything's everything's going smoothly from the client or the operation side. Um, yeah, that sounds so familiar. It's it's whatever is important today. <laughs> and then you try to fight the fight of strategy of being strategic and not reactive but everybody within the company needs to know there's somebody who can put out a fire or address a concern or a problem in the business that nobody else is thinking about if someone else is thinking about it and on top of it i don't need to worry about it but um it yeah, sounds very, said it very well there i think you know the, the fight between being strategic and, and reactive yeah it's a, a day-to-day -day battle Oh my gosh, it's so hard. But uh, I love I love learning about your platform. I like the the mission, and I I can I can totally understand why a front office a portfolio analysts would would want to have a tool like this. So um, everybody should check it out. It's Everisk E V E R Y S K dot com. You can see the link in the in the show notes. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show, Nick. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. Enjoyed it a lot. Hey, so this is Alec Isaac. Alec, you want to tell everybody uh, your title and uh, what you do for Intrinio? Welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I am VP of Product at Intrinio, and uh, essentially, I think that means a startup jack of all, master of a few if you're lucky, um, and just trying to keep the products flowing, keep everything going. Yeah, well, it's good to really good to have you back. You uh, have always got an interesting take on data and what's happening out there. Um, can you talk? It would be nice to hear your perspective about product. Like, what are our products, and why do we why do we define them the way we do? What is a data product? Just hit me with it. I think in our terms, because we're mainly you know API focused, the product is the API. And that just kind of boils down to the functionality, right? How easy is the API to use? What kind of data is it returning? And then like the whole, what kind of data is returning is a subsect of like, what is this API's purpose, right? Is it market data, fundamental equity? Are we getting some alternative data in there? So really just trying to build out that kind of decision. And then obviously where are we gonna get the data, right? Is it, you know, free sourced, exchange, um, SEC, are we going to kind of mine it out of all this kind of alternative data space where it's going to where like, you know, the meme stocks, et cetera, what are people saying? So there's just tons of data floating out there. The internet things keeps blowing it up even more. And uh, I don't think we'll ever be, you know, run low on product decisions. <laughs> no, no. I, we have these weekly meetings with you and it's like, there's always this list of data we want to add, changes to the API we want to make, features, requests. It kind of seems to be endless. Do you think people are are used to thinking of data as a product now? I mean, it's been, what, 20, 30 years since people started having access to computers and, you know, data started becoming cheaper to store and easier to access. Like, is data as a product something that like normal people are starting to get comfortable with that, you know, is it, or is it still a fringe thing or is it mostly businesses that think of it that way? I think it's pretty common now, you know, every data is truly everything, right? Every website you're seeing, they're templating it out there via API, via some sort of kind of, they're getting it somewhere, right? And the API populating a front end that's really kind of catching on now no longer do you have like server side sending it um so i really think apis are catching on i think a lot of people are also saying like we don't need to actually build a website right we can just pull this in locally csvs build models use dashboards i think it's really kind of making it flexible for all kinds of users not just businesses so i see that expanding bigger and bigger right like everything around the industry just going to be yeah. very big that's good to hear, given what we're selling. Um, and it, it's, it seems to happen more and more that when we talk to customers, they're, they're like expecting data to be productized the way we do it via API and easy to access. Like, can you tell, tell our listeners, which is probably my mom and 
you know, a couple other internal people's moms, but can you tell our list? Yeah. Hi. Can you tell our listeners uh, what you're seeing in terms of trends when you talk to customers? Like, what are they asking for? Like, are they, do they care more about functionality or they just want coverage of certain data types? Like what are the, what are clients telling you um, when you're out there talking to them about our products? I think at the end of the day, it's both, you know, they're always clients, customers, et cetera. They always want everything they can, um, in the easiest fashion possible. And that's where really what kind of makes those, those meetings we have tricky, right? Where we have such a long list and we got to kind of prioritize like, Hey, like this is going to make the most impact now. And so I think really it's easeability. Like it's not even a word easeability. I'm going to say it's yes. a good word. I'll, it's a good one. I'm going to use it. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> Easeability, usability <laughs> is one, um, but easeability of these endpoints, right, is really important. If if you can't really get the data in in the format you want, it doesn't matter if we have everything. So that's really step one: is making the endpoints just easy to use, great docs, making that process simple, and then we're going to expand into. I know we already discussed the SEC is going to put out like putting a proposal out for short interest, right? Making more uh, transparency around that. That's a data point we would certainly ingest and start delivering, right? That's still popular, um, keeps kind of both sides of the fields honest, but yeah, just kind of niche novel ideas. You know, it's just, um, it's all about information. Yeah, you can't go wrong with short interest. I feel like I've heard people ask for that for, Every month for the last six years, somebody's asked me for short interest data. Do you know mm-hmm. why that's such a popular uh, data point? I think they're just, you know, hoping for a squeeze. That's really it, right? Like, oh, this one's high, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to have to rally to cover, et cetera, right? They're just going to step over each other. It kind of makes you wonder, like, should you just buy short interest stocks just to be in them for that? But realistically, I think a lot of people... I think you need people, you know, who are on both sides of the fence, right? They're shorting a stock because clearly they say this stock is, you know, this equity company, et cetera, isn't up to snuff, right? This, this valuation's tied from reality or lost from reality. And I think you need those people to bring it back down to earth. Um, you know, the more mm. ETFs, et cetera, I think it's what over 50% of flows go to ETFs. There's no price discovery involved anymore. And so I think, this might be unpopular opinion, but you, you still need, you know, firms out there to short equities and keep them honest. Yeah. I, I, we hear, we hear this thinking, I've heard this question before with options and it's very similar to the short interest. Um, the short interest question is that like somebody, there's always two sides to a trade. So if you know there's short interest, you know, well, there's a whole bunch of people that are short the stock. But then on the other side of that trade, there's a whole, the same number, maybe, uh, or similar number of people who are on the other side of that trade. It's the same thing with unusual options activity. You know, someone's buying or selling, um, you know, large amounts of options on a certain stock. What does that really tell you? Like, do you think that people are just looking for changes in these metrics or do they, can you actually tell something from short interest or unusual options? I think it's tough when you don't have the full picture. Um, A good analogy would be kind of like they, you know, unusual options, short interest, et cetera, will tell you perhaps like you're going to a lake, right? You see a bunch of, you know, professional fishermen in one spot, like, okay, these pros are playing in this area of the lake, right? But you go there, you might Mm. not be able to see what kind of lure they're using or, you know, equipment, et cetera, right? So you, you know, you're in the right spot, you know, something's going on here but perhaps you don't know exactly how to play the game the same. So I think it's important that you kind of are aware of that, but always take everything with a grain of salt. You know, they might have a totally different objective than yours. Um, And I know I spoke to a buddy of mine recently about this, where the, you have a buyer seller, then you have everyone else, right? So let's say I'm just holding, um, you know, equity A, I'm just holding it for the long term, right? I like it. It's checking all my boxes. The market price is just on the top layer of people buying and selling. And both sides thinks they're right and wrong, right? Like the seller thinks, oh, the buyer's an idiot. You know, this is the peak right here. And the buyer's like, wow, the seller's going to miss out (laughs) on the upside. And then you have everyone else holding it, just chilling, you know? So I think people get caught up in that price where if you like it long term, it'll continue to go. But 
We'll see. You know, I think it's just all about discovery, right? Information making it available. That's the most important part. Yeah, I like your fishing analogy because to me, unusual options activity or short interest activity is just telling you where the volatility is. Where's the action? Where's their, you know, it, it could be going up, it could be going down. You don't know, but you, you prop, I would imagine if you did some back testing, if you look at increasing short interest or increasing unusual options activity, you would see greater changes in stock prices in those securities. And so it just tells you like, hey, if you're an active trader rather than a passive trader, these are the places that you might want to keep an eye out. And then you're going to have to do your own research beyond just knowing, hey, something's going on here. A lot of people are watching this or, or, or increasing their interest. Exactly. That's exactly it. You know, either you got a, I don't know, your little net out there and you're just waiting for the fish to come. You're along, you're in for the long haul or, you know, you're actively trying to catch those fish. But yeah, like everything else, and that's where I think kind of financial data fits the role, right, is just providing everyone with the information possible to, you know, I like to say, go down your own ship, right? Where you don't want to take it. It always hurts, you know, when you, and someone says, oh, do X, Y, and Z, right? You do it, doesn't work out. And you're like, man, that sucked. Like, this is dumb. It's a little easier to swallow if you, you tell yourself to do X, Y, and Z. You know, you're like, oh, went down on hmm. my own ship. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You like to take responsibility for your failures because at least exactly. nobody told you to do that. I like that. Yeah, I like that mentality, that independence. Um, all right, we've only got a few more minutes today. Uh, I feel like I could talk to you all day. Uh, I want to ask you about a topic that used to be important to me, um, and that is getting as much data as possible on a single platform or a single API. We used to talk about this at Intrinio, it, like let's just get every data set possible on a single API to cut down on customers' uh, integration costs. And mm -hmm. you see this happening all over the place, like places like Amazon and the big exchanges. Everybody's trying to consolidate as much data as possible under a single roof. Do you think that clients, people who consume data on massive scale, do you think they care about reducing their the integration costs across different venues or are they just more interested in getting the data? I think it's more just getting the data, you know, I think it definitely maybe will like ease the mind, right? You're getting it from one source. You only have kind of one fault point there really, right? Where it's like, okay, they go down, we're, we're going down. Um, when you spread that a little wider, then you start to have like multiple places you need to monitor, et cetera. Um, aside mm -hmm. from that though, I think it is fine to, you know, use different sources, you know, like it, one person might do it better than the other, et cetera, but you really want this feed here, that feed there, whatever your platforms, you know, whatever your customers want is what you should be aiming to get. And then kind of thinking, okay, what's the best practice forward? So I know that's kind of our goal is to really be a one-stop shop. So they only have to worry about like our integrations. And a lot of it too kind of comes down to documentation, et cetera, where you're having to learn different docs, different best practices for different platforms that'll increase dev time um so that's another benefit i guess one stop shop is just you know what you feel comfortable and yeah i think it's just in the end it's uh beauties in the behind eye of the beholder so <laughs> to pick what's best yeah. yeah that's for sure i uh i've had some clients talk to me about vendor risk and as in you you mentioned this is that like you've got one neck to choke you've got one api or one provider one platform where if they go down you're really toast but you're going to have fewer small outages do you think vendor risk of it can be reduced by having multiple providers or even having multiple sources of the same type of data um like if you're getting we're working our project like this internally where we're getting a secondary source of a certain data set so that if one goes offline, we're not offline. Like, do you think that that's worthwhile for companies? I think redundancy is always great, right? You always want to kind of have that best source of truth. You can always check things between the two as well. So I'm all for redundancy. I think at the end of the day, though, a lot of these firms, you know, all beholden really to AWS, right? So AWS goes down, you know, GCP <laughs> goes down, 
It, I don't yeah. care how, how far spread thin you are. You hope you're not in the wrong region. Um, so that's really kind yeah. of the ultimate vendor risk that you can't um, get away from. But oh, it's, they got that's great a great point. I I didn't I didn't think about that. But like, yeah, regardless of how many financial data vendors you have, they're all hosting on AWS. You're still not spreading your risk around at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Great point. Well, you heard it here first, uh, folks. Uh, <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Fish where the expert fishermen are fishing. <laughs> and think think about where you get your data from. Uh, you can save energy getting it in one place, but you're going to consolidate your risk. Thanks for coming back, Alec. I appreciate having you on. Thanks for having me, man. This is always, always a treat. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And see. All right, so it's time for my ramble. This is take three of this ramble. We don't always get it exactly right. So thanks to Brianna for hanging with me. But this is a lecture or um, a ramble where we talk about financial data topics and I get to be a little biased because I work at Intrino, so I usually talk about stuff we care about. Um, sometimes this is referred to as a self-interview. So in this, if I was asking myself the question, what are standardized financials? The this little ramble is going to be the answer to that question. We talk about this all the time at Intrinio because we sell uh, standardized financials as one of our main products. Um, but what is the standardization process? What is that for? Why do you need it? Why is it important? And so I'm going to uh, share my screen, which is not something I usually do because I know a lot of you are listening to this on the radio. Um, but I'm going to explain what I'm showing while I show it. So. Um, you can see on my screen now, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube or VHS tape or whatever you're using, uh, you can see and follow along. But for everybody else, I've got up a demonstration um, of some Intrinio data. And I've got Apple and I've got um, also got um, financial data for Caterpillar. And it's coming in from uh, a certain period, so like Q4 2021. And I'm scrolling down on my page, and so you can see the as reported financials for Apple and Caterpillar side by side. So this is the data as it was reported by these big companies to the SEC. So they're required by law every quarter. They have to report filings because they're publicly traded in the United States. So they send this data into the SEC. And what I have on my screen is what's referred to as the as reported. So what exactly did they report? You can see um, the category, like on the left, I've got Apple revenue from contract with customer excluding assessed tax. And on the right next to it, you can see Caterpillar reporting revenues. Um, they've got three different line items for revenues and there's the cost of goods sold. There's all these different data tags and I've got the as reported financials up side by side. And the first thing that you'll notice is that these companies, when they reported to the SEC, didn't report the same data tags. So, um, you know, costs and expenses, maybe app is reported by Caterpillar, maybe Apple has that and they call it something else. You've got operating expenses. This is really hard to digest if you wanna compare Apple to Caterpillar in the as reported format. Why? It's because the SEC mandates that they report in this format called XBRL, but they don't um, force them to report in their revenues in certain categories. They allow them to make their own categories or not report certain categories. It's kind of a mess. So if you're an analyst or an investor and you're like, hmm, do I want to buy Apple right now or do I want to buy Caterpillar? You look at their fundamentals. That's a very uh, popular approach is to look at, you know, how much revenue are they making, other expenses. If you wanted to analyze these two companies next to each other with their as reported fundamentals, it's going to take a long time. You're going to probably spend, if you know what you're doing, uh, several hours just getting these in a nice format. So you can say, you know, what's the difference between Caterpillar and Apple? Um, financial statements and how do I invest in them? So this is a problem. You can imagine with just two companies, it's it's a problem um, that is several hours, but imagine if you wanted to look at thousand companies or 25 different companies or 
a hundred comparisons in a day um, across all the companies in the United States. You're going to need a whole team just to analyze and standardize this data into some sort of format you can use it in. So that's where Ingenio comes in. We take these standardized um, data that you can see is completely um, in different formats, impossible to compare. I'm scrolling down for those of you that are listening to the podcast. And uh, now I'm showing the standardized financials. And you can see that Intrinio has mapped all those different um, financial tags that were reported by the companies to standardized buckets. So Apple has an operating revenue. Caterpillar has an operating revenue. Um, Apple has total revenue. Caterpillar has total revenue. And they're so standardized that we've got a percent difference there between them. So we can calculate how much more total revenue did Apple have than Caterpillar and vice versa. We can actually turn that into a percent or a ratio, whatever you want to do. But because you have these standard buckets, we can quickly get an idea of the difference between these companies. You know, some things like um, income tax expense, there's a 713% difference between these companies. You know, you want to ask questions about basic earnings per share. Well, Caterpillar has 50% more. That's pretty easy to calculate. That's pretty interesting. Um, metric to consider when you're when you're buying these stocks. So if you have this in a standardized format like this, it makes it very easy to quickly say, what companies um, do I want to invest in? What's the difference between them? How do they compare? We use the horrible pun all the time of apples to apples because we're comparing Apple to um, right now Caterpillar. Um, but this is what standardized financials are, and this is what they look like. So um, this is in a visualized format. We all put this data in API or a database. Um, and if you are an investor or you're building a platform or anything like that, you want to get this in a standardized format because that's the format people want it in when they're comparing across securities. If you want, we provide the as reported data. You can get that from the SEC as well. Um, we provide that in a nice database format, easy to output, easy to look at. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people that provide that and you can get it yourself. And it's actually not as hard of a problem as mapping all of these, now I'm scrolling up again, unstandardized buckets into standardized categories. As I'm scrolling up, you can even see that Caterpillar has more categories, more things they report than Apple. So like they don't even have the same length of uh, data sets here. And so when you standardize it, it becomes easy to use and quite clear. And I'm going to show you one more little demonstration here. Um, I've got the return on equity of Apple versus Caterpillar, and I've got it graphed here. And this is the next level. If you're an analyst, this is definitely um, an interesting way to look at the data. We can look historically that Caterpillars had this massive dip in uh, return on equity compared to Apple, and we can dig into that and ask why and you know what that means. But you know historically, going back to 2010, just as far back as this particular data set goes, I can look at these two companies side by side and start asking questions. You know, like am I going to get a better return on equity with Apple over Caterpillar, why? Is it always going to be like that? Was one cheaper than the other because of that? Those are the questions you want to get to. You don't want to spend your time standardizing. So this is what standardized data is and why we use it. And um, an example of what it looks like, there are a lot of companies that do standardization of data. Um, there are companies like um, FactSet where you can get this data. There are companies like Bloomberg, um, S&P. These are big, big companies and they standardize things their own way. So not everybody's gonna pick these same buckets. Um, you can make multiple standardized templates. And if you wanna go get that data from any of those big companies, it's extremely expensive. You know, they, they're charging um, quite, a, uh, quite a bit of money. And Trinio standardizes this data with machine learning, whereas most companies standardize this with like a manual approach. You have a team and they map things to buckets and it's a little bit slower. We prefer our method. It, um, is, it allows us to expand much more quickly um, to new data sets and to standardize uh, new companies at, at scale. But when someone mentions standardized, financials to you. Hopefully you'll be able to think of this and understand why it's so important.